Okay, good afternoon to everyone joining us here in Boston and to those of you online, good morning or good evening or whatever the appropriate temporal greeting is for you. In this work with my colleagues at the University of Waterloo, we focused on the way companies use or share the data they collect from their users and how it's continued to evolve over time. It's no longer limited to this kind of classical scenario where one organization provides data to another in the interest of generating advertising revenue. Variations include things like the Google and MasterCard deal where they tried to determine an intersection, see if a digital ad resulted in a sale in a physical store. We also see more and more tech companies getting involved with health data. This can come in the form of health research or some sort of collaboration with a hospital wanting to work with their data. Further, we can see cases like a subsidiary where, the, for example, might be a coffee company collecting so much location data on their users that someone who just wanted to schedule to be able to pick up their coffee on their way to work at a convenient time ends up having where they live, work, or even vacation being known to the parent company. And the interesting thing, or the not so fortunate thing with all of these different data evolutions that have been occurring, is particularly in Canada and the United States, what we tend to see is this information is provided to individuals in the form of privacy policies. And within these privacy policies, it falls into these big buckets of third parties or trusted partners. And so what we wanted to do with this work is focus on trying to disambiguate these buckets and to see if we presented the individuals in our study with very specific types of data sharing where perhaps both individuals or both organizations get data, maybe only one or many organizations provide data to another, do these different types change the acceptability of the data sharing practices? And further, if we looked at existing user controls that we tend to look at in literature, like how consent, is <laughs> how consent is attained, what the purpose of use is, or how long the data is retained, are there also variations within these controls based on the type of data sharing occurring? And to find the answers to these questions, we used SurveyMonkey to recruit over 1,000 participants, and we used gender and age balancing. And so this was in March of 2021. Now, after we excluded all the participants who responded to that the shape of a red ball was blue, we had a nice number of over 900 to work with. Each of the participants in our study received one of 12 scenarios and a series of questions corresponding to the user controls we had identified, ending with a free-form response question. With the exception of the free-form response, all answers came on a five-point semantic differential scale, ranging from completely unacceptable through to completely completely acceptable. Now, after looking through the news and different kind of law considerations that had come across in Canada and the United States, we identified five types of sharing that we wanted to focus on. Now, for those of you saying there are six boxes up there, you are correct. <laughs> we did add an additional case where the only varied variation for the validation is we changed the order of the text to make sure we could know in advance if the, in, when we introduced the companies, say we said there's a tech company involved or there's a health company, when we presented those descriptions, we wanted to see if the order influenced the acceptability. Now, fortunately, when we did the statistical test, we found no indications that it changed the acceptability, which meant we, when we went into the remaining types, we could confidently not have to continue considering that in our analysis. We did include in our types a one-way two-party exchange, which kind of ties back to that classical two-party advertising situation where one organization provides data to another. But we also have cases where both entities receive data, so a two-way two-party exchange. We have the kind of data broker situation where multiple organizations provide data to a single organization. And we have organizations where there's a startup that got bought out by a bigger company. And within each of the types we identified, we include two variations. With the main kind of system going through it is that a tech company would receive the data in the one case, if it's not a both situation, and a health company would receive it in the other. Now, 
For the remainder of this talk, I'm just going to highlight some of my favorite results or the results that we kind of tie most into the takeaways of our surveys. If you want more, I highly invite you to look at our paper because we look at the analysis across all 900 participants. We look at comparing between the different types we identified and within them. Starting off just nice and general with some descriptive statistics. Now, we show the general acceptability when participants weren't given any additional information about the type of sharing that was going on. About 45% said, ugh, this is kind of not so great. I'm going to say it's either completely unacceptable or just in general unacceptable. But we do still see this cluster of 30% of that over 900 participants who were like, yeah, I'm, I'm OK with this. You can, you can use my data in this scenario. I don't have further questions. My initial vibe is this is fine, with them saying that it was either somewhat acceptable or completely acceptable. When we get into some of our user controls, we can now do some statistical analysis and compare between them. Now, these are the labels that you'll see in our results in our paper. I promise you we did not tell the participants that consent was concealed. But instead, what they would have seen is a description that said, a company that you are a user of ended up using your data in this situation. You found out about it by seeing a news article in, in your morning web search. And unsurprisingly, this was overwhelmingly negative. Assumed consent is the case that is the more honest version of a privacy policy. There was no real way for you to opt out. It was just shown to you in the privacy policy, which we all know you probably didn't read. Opt out consent is, well, the default cookie setting. When you see those cookie bars at the bottom, you have to go through this process and click and get to the state where you no longer have to participate in sharing your cookies. Opt in, gold standard, everyone thinks it's the best in our participant pool and probably everyone in this room where you have to explicitly choose to have your data used in this setting. For all four of these consent cases that we considered, these were all statistically significantly different from one another. So when our participants are saying they really like opt-in consent and like opt-out consent is okay, that is a strong difference and not something that kind of suggests we can keep defaulting to an opt-out setting. I call this the fun or slightly concerning by means of very concerning result in the sense that when we talk about data retention, if I tell the people in this room that a company is going to continue to keep your data while they are using it, you likely understand that that could be forever. They may never stop using it. Maybe they used it to train a machine learning model and it's going to exist in that until that model is gone. However, when presented to the participants in our study, they didn't consider this to be similar to that indefinitely setting. In fact, it was statistically different than indefinitely and lining up more with the description of for a set time. So while the company is using it was viewed as the same as like for our research studies where we tell our participants after some number of years, we'll delete this data, when in reality, that is not more similar to while in use. And so this highlights how the granularity of details really needs to be focused when we're having regulations or policy on how to present this information to users or as a community or developers, what we're informing them. Because it's very easy to have something that could lead to a dark pattern that could manipulate users into agreeing something that perhaps they didn't actually mean to. Highlighting these sharing types I keep talking about, we did find that there were statistical differences between the types of data. And the one I'm highlighting here is we have the acquisition scenario where some company bought out another or the two companies merged and then were acquired by a third company being more acceptable than these cases where one company is providing data to another or multiple companies are providing to data to another. And when we look at this, we can hypothesize that despite the fact that a merger or an acquisition could be for the companies about the data they're going to acquire from that other organization. When an individual is looking at that in terms of their data, it's not seen so obviously as a sale or being about having their data sent off to someone else. And so it leans more towards this positive side, even though 
it may or may not be what they actually intended. But the key takeaway being how the data is being provided has an impact. And if you want to see more about this, look in our paper, because we also see patterns of this when we talk about those user controls I had, like the way consent was obtained and how long the data is retained for, and also purpose, which I've kind of skipped over because, well, to be quite honest, the results are using data to improve services is much better, pretty good. Using data to generate revenue, not so great as we might expect. So to wrap things up for you, the granularity of information that is conveyed to individuals, whether via privacy policies or otherwise, isn't sufficient in current systems to provide the information users need to make an informed decision as to what their preferences actually are. And so, given the results of this paper, we're saying you need to disambiguate these third parties and make explicit who's receiving data, whether it's multiple organizations, and who these organizations are. And finally, the ongoing theme that came out through some of the stats I talked about today, but also in our free form responses, is the importance of acquiring explicit versus this implicit consent. And so thank you, and I would be happy to take your questions.